I ran on to a passage from one of Elred's sermons from the work of his that's clearly the least read, uh, his sermons on the prophetic burdens of Isaiah. And I loved it so much because of the way it represented his voice and also told me something about him as a lover of scripture and also his self-understanding as a writer that I thought I would introduce you to him today with this passage. And so brothers, the more outer persecution or inner disturbance saddens us, the more does divine consolation from the sacred writings cheer us. I say to you, brothers, nothing adverse can happen, nothing so sad or bitter can take place, which does not quickly vanish or is not more easily endured as soon as the sacred page is open to us. This is the field to which Isaac went to meditate when the day was already drawing to a close. Rebecca met him there and relieved his pain with her sweetness. How often does day give way to evening for me, good Jesus? How often does unbearable pain take the place of what little consolation I have, just as the dark of night succeeds daylight? All things turn to boredom, and everything that I see is a burden. If someone speaks, I barely hear. If someone knocks, I barely perceive it. My heart grows as hard as a rock. My tongue clings to my palate and my eyes dry up. What then? I go out, of course, to the field to meditate. I reflect on the sacred book. And I fix my meditations in wax. Then suddenly Rebecca comes to meet me. In other words, your grace, good Jesus, scatters the darkness with your light, drives away boredom and breaks up the hardness. Soon tears follow sighs and heavenly joy accompanies tears. Unhappy are those who do not enter this field and rejoice in this way when some sadness disturbs them. So I'm going to begin today by just giving you an overview of Elred's life, but I thought before I did that, I would say something about uh, our sources for Elred. There are two principal sources. One is uh, The Life of Elred by Walter Daniel who was apparently his secretary and his medical assistant in the last 17 years of his life. Walter's book is absolutely fundamental for us. It's a chronological survey of Aylward from the time he's a child until, he's, uh, until he dies. It's, he's, he's picking and choosing what he includes. He wants to show a holy man. So he says at the beginning of his life, I proceed to reveal the root of such great goodness that they who are willing to see may see the outshining sanctity of him and that his great glory may not be hid in the earth and be concealed from those who, thirsting in spirit, are wont to embrace examples of the good. So he's very clear. He's trying to tell us about a holy man. And like all works of holy men, he is not telling things that he thinks don't enhance the holiness. He doesn't talk much about his life outside the monastery. He doesn't give us historical context. But we're so fortunate to have it. The other thing that's central is Elred's own writings. Now, I don't believe in reading them autobiographically. I don't believe when he says, uh, I wept with pain because of, I don't think we necessarily have to believe that that means that that passage is about something he experienced. But we get a real sense of what he was thinking about, what kind of writing he wanted to do. We get to know him as a writer, as someone who is self-consciously a writer, including having a real interest in following the models of other writers he's read. So, for example, we know because he tells us that he wanted to imitate Cicero in his work on friendship. We know because he quotes the Venerable Bede all the time, how much he venerated the Venerable Bede and how much he wants to quote from him. Elward is a writer and he's insistent on that. So we can see quite a lot about where he is, what he's thinking about, who he's interacting with. And we can see what later works have been, have depended on what he's written. Elred uh, had a life that was from well before he was born, 
deeply troubled by violence. And I'm sure that the violence that anticipated him led in many ways to who he was. The fact that he talks quite a lot about seeking peace, desiring peace, uh, commending his monks to peace, has to do with the fact that the stories of his family have to do with, um, with violence, with disruption. So by the end of the 8th century, the Vikings were attacking England, were burning monasteries, were burning towns. Even before that, at the end of the 7th century, St. Cuthbert, who was on Holy Island or Lindisfarne, uh, when he died, his monks had ended up carrying him around the north of England for a couple of centuries. And apparently, one of the monks who was responsible for carrying Cuthbert's body was an ancestor of Eilert's. So already there's an ancestry of someone who is displaced um, in terms of vocation, in terms of life, in terms of, of uh, where he lived, to move south into England. Uh, and in fact, Cuthbert's body ended up being at the Cathedral of Durham. Aylward's great-grandfather, who was apparently a kind of wild old man but learned, was a member of the cathedral chapter at Durham, and he then had responsibility for looking after the relics of St. Cuthbert. So uh, we have that kind of connection between the monks who carried Cuthbert and then Aylward's own family who's responsible for Cuthbert. And in fact, the bones of Bede eventually came to Durham as well. So Aylward's great-grandfather was um, custodian of both of them. Then, of course, in 1066, the Normans came to England. Well, there we have another act of violence, another radical disruption. And as part of that disruption, the new bishop of, the, of uh, Durham ruled that every monk, every member of the chapter who was married had to leave. Uh, and that included Aaron's grandfather. At this point, priests were married. There was nothing unusual about that. But all of a sudden, all the priests in the cathedral chapter at Durham had to leave, except well, they didn't have to if they didn't, um, if they were willing to abandon their wives. But as luck would have it, none of them were willing to abandon their lives, wives. So the only one who remained at Durham was a widower. So that worked out well for him, but all the others had to find other things to do with their life. So Arid's grandfather now was sent out to the town of Hexham, which had been radically destroyed, first by Vikings and then by Normans, and he and his family settled there and started to rebuild the church. And Edward says that he lived by fowling and by hunting. So, you know, nothing like grocery stores. He's, he's hunting the food for the family. His son, Edward's father, uh, took up the task when his father died. So he too was a priest. And his, his brother also then became a monk. So this is the ancestry of Eilred, a life of constant disruption. Um, and the way that must have colored him, both in terms of stories of the past, so he's very much a son of, of Anglo-Saxon England, but also of being a son of the church, being, being in fact the great-grandson and grandson and grandson of priests. So, but it's a good deal, right? Because he can probably also be a priest, just like his father and grandfather and great-grandfather. Except the next thing that comes along is Gregorian reform. And guess what? Priests can't be married anymore. Now, I will say the church tried hard to make priests simply send away their wives, but you know, their wives didn't go. So then they said that they could keep their wives, but no more sex. Uh, but their wives, of course, were useful for cooking and cleaning and so on, so they could hang around. But you know what? They kept having more babies. So the next thing was that people, uh, the parishioners were told they couldn't receive the sacraments uh, from these priests with wives. But you know, the people went right on receiving. Finally, in 1093, a wonderful decision was reached, which I think is just brilliant which said, from now on, sons of priests cannot become priests 
unless they first take vows of celibacy as a priest or a canon. So, Aylward had two brothers and probably some sisters. Um, two of his two brothers, and we don't know, by the way, Aylward's uh, birth order. People often assume he was first. There's no reason to think that except that, you know, if you believe in birth order statistics, he was bright, he was able, he was noticeable. Uh, the other two sons, in fact, went to secular life. Aaron, it, it wasn't clear about what he was going to do with his life. As it worked out, he went off to king, live at the court of the King of Scotland. Now, this is not a normal path for the son of a parish priest in the north of England. There have been lots of guesses about why he went to Scotland, to the court, I myself think it's because Thurston, the Bishop of York, when he came to visit the church in Hexham, saw this bright little boy and knew that he didn't have a chance to be a priest, but he had influence with the King of Scotland and he said, I know this bright little boy, why don't you, you've got three sons around the place, why don't you take him in? And so now Aylward had probably studied uh, at either Durham or York, again, we don't know where, uh, for a few years, but he leaves his schooling. He goes to court, uh, the court of King David of Scotland. He grows up with David's son, Prince Henry, and his two older boys who are actually English aristocrats. Um, it's clear that he did a lot of reading and after a while, he became the king's steward with responsibility for household responsibilities. I keep thinking that in, in our context, um, you could best call the steward the seller. I mean, those are the kinds of responsibilities he had. During that time then, he had a great opportunity to meet visiting aristocrats. Uh, and to, to learn how to deal with them. He developed diplomatic skills. He developed an ability to exercise authority because he, of course, had people at the court working under him. He also had to develop real humility, though. If you are a friend of the king's sons, but you're not the king's son, if you're working for the king and you have authority over servants, but you are always serving underneath the king, then you have to learn how to balance those things. And I think he learned not only authority, but also humility. He also learned French. Now, I was thinking about this. We do not think that St. Bernard knew English, right? I mean, it's just a kind of unthinkable idea. But Aaron knows French, knows Latin, knows English. And at the court of Scotland, where they spoke French, he learned French. Think of this advantage that this gave to him. And so when he ended up leaving the court, he took with him authority and humility and language. I think that his time at court of about 10 years was a time of discernment, trying to decide whether he would be happy continuing at the court in a high position as a courtier, or whether perhaps he wanted to follow in the steps of his father and grandfather and great-grandfather. Walter says two things. One is that in his years at court, he was increasingly beginning to think about religious life. That's the first thing he says. He seems to forget that, though, when he describes Aylward's leaving court, because he says the story is and you may already know it, that Aylward went to England on a task for the king, and we don't know what it was, but the first thing he did was to visit the bishop, Bishop Thurston, at York, and then he went on, and he went and he heard, as it happens, about this new monastery, and so he dropped in at the new monastery just to visit, and he was met at the gates of the new monastery by, I don't know, the abbot, the prior, and the choir master. And then he spent the day there. And that night, he went and he spent the night at the home of Walter S. Speck, who was the patron of the monastery. And the next day, he was on his way back to, to Scotland, presumably with the king's horses and everything. And he said to one of the people he was with, 
you know, I'd like to drop in there again. Now, dropping in at Riveau, I mean, you're up on a flat area, and then you go down a very long road that curves down into the valley. And he says, I think I'll stay here, keeping the king's horse, right? Now, I think these two stories contradict themselves. I think that when Walter says he was already thinking about religious life, he forgets that when he gives us this, this story of Pauline conversion, a suddenness, which depends, among other things, on the people he's traveling with agreeing to going down the long road for one more visit. When he gets down to the bottom, may I say, he is again met by a group of the older members, senior members of the monastery, and he enters. I think that the trip to, and I'm saying I here to make it clear this is my own view, um, I think that he went to England on that trip precisely because Thurston and David had said, you know, I wonder if this bright young man who's thinking about religious life would be interested in this two-year-old monastery that's been founded from France. He might be a good fit there. And so down he went into England, down he went to Riveau, he spent the night with the patrons and then went the next day and entered so the story of conversion, you can take Walter Daniels' story, which is sudden, a burst of light, which illuminated him, or the one that I think is more historically probable, that he, that he went down to check it out um, as monks, as people who become monks do. They don't just drop out of the sky, they've already been thinking about it. So, Elred arrives at Riveau with the skills he's brought with him with authority, with uh, humility, with languages, with diplomatic background. And in no time at all, his abbot, uh, who is himself English, uh, had, had served Bernard as secretary for a while, Abbot William. Um, his abbot is taking him with him, taking Aylward with him on trips to handle business of various kinds. And in 1141, he is sent with a group of other priests and, and um, prelates from the north of England to go to Rome to protest the election of William Fitzherbert as the Bishop of uh, York. William Fitzherbert is the nephew of King Stephen. King Stephen is putting a lot, or has put a lot of pressure on to get William elected. And the Cistercians, especially, are not happy about it. So Aylward goes with a group of people to protest to the Rome, to Rome. Imagine what an experience this is. Yeah, he's lived at court, he's had some life, but he hasn't been out of the north of England and Scotland. And one day he is with leading prelates, riding horses down across con the continent presumably spending a night at, at um, Clairvaux, because Bernard is very interested in this issue and has written several rabid letters attacking William Fitzherbert, and then going on across the Alps and down to Rome. When I'm in Rome, I look at it and think, here's the gate where he must have entered. What must it have been like for him to be there? That's his only trip to Italy that we know of. Then he goes back, and when he gets back to Riveau, he's named novice master. Very shortly after that, he is uh, named the, the abbot, the founding abbot, of Riveau's third daughter house of Reevesby, down in Lincolnshire. And so off he goes with the young community and does wonderfully well there. Uh, Walter says he builds it up both spiritually and physically. He makes some enemies because the Cistercians tended, we would like not to think this, but they tended to clear away villages so that they could set up their new houses. And so he has set up, so, so Reevesby's successful founding included the loss of villages and of, of houses of people. Walter suggests that he was much admired by the king at that time, King Stephen, um, and we know that he wrote, Father Chrysogonus of Gethsemane um, tells us that his first collection of 28 sermons uh, 
was probably written while he was at Reevesby, that he can tell that by the liturgical sources that are present in those sermons. He's at Reevesby for two years, uh, and Walter tells us a few miracles. My favorite one is that the subprior was not well. He hadn't been well for quite a while. He was spending time in the infirmary. And although Walter describes him as really in terrible, terrible shape, it's clear that Arid thought perhaps he didn't, wasn't in such terrible shape as it appeared. So one day, Arid went through the infirmary and said, Brother, you are needed in choir. Tomorrow you should return and, and join your brothers in the psalmody. And as it happens, the next day the subprior was up and lived a good long life with his brothers. I think this story tells us so much, not that Elred, um, you know, makes the sign of a cross and says, get up now, and he's suddenly healed, but that he relates to him as a brother in the house, asks him to do what he should be doing with the other brothers, does not chastise him, does not scold him, just says, it's time to go back to church. This is, this is actually my favorite one of Edward's miracles, better than the time when he healed the man who had swallowed a frog. And, uh, and he managed to say, okay, spit it out in my hand and out hopped the grown frog. That's a, that's a nice story, but I'm much more fond of the story of the subprior at Reevesby. After uh, two years there or so, the abbot, by now Abbot Morris um, of Rivo, resigned abruptly. And so Rivo, of course, had to have a new election. Well, who did they elect? Surprise, surprise, Aylred. Now, the thing is, the surprise, surprise business, I, I personally wonder if he hadn't been um, sort of looked at as a future prior all that time. I've been around monasteries often enough to hear elderly monks say about young monks, I think he's going to be a good abbot someday. Um, I don't think it's a surprise that Elred was being looked on as the abbot. But in fact, that very idea apparently caused some consternation because he almost wasn't elected abbot because some of the monks at Rivo thought he was ambitious and so thought he was presumably careerist. And so he just almost wasn't elected. And I like to think about what Reevesby might have been, how Reevesby might have grown if the monks at Rivo had turned him down and then Reevesby had kept him. Perhaps Reevesby would have become the great Cistercian monastery of the North. But as it works out, Rivo got him. And he was the abbot there for the next, the next 20 years. As he grew old, oh, and Walter says that, um, that he was very prosperous at Rivo, that at the time of his death, there were 140 monks and 500 conversing. And part of the reason he was so successful, um, Walter says, is because he said no one should be turned away from Rivo. He said... All, whether weak or strong, should find in Rivo a haunt of peace, and there, like the fish in the broad sea, possess the welcome, happy, spacious peace of charity. As Edward approached his death, and he wasn't very old, um, 57, I think, um, as he was approaching death, he, he had a number of physical ailments, and the general chapter had allowed him to move into what we tend to think of as a hut, but in fact, apparently, Walter refers to it as a mausoleum. It was apparently a big place, uh, and monks would come to spend time with him. They would gather around him 30, 40, 50 at a time. For a long time, I thought, well, yeah, it was warm there. Of course they came there. But then it occurred to me that if they hadn't wanted to be in his company, they would have gone ahead staying cold wherever they were. That there was something about his presence, his relationship that made them want to be with him. 
It also seems clear that if there are 30 or 40 around, they're talking to each other, which means he's picking up a lot of what's going on in the house. And there are a couple of stories about when he speaks to one of the monks, suggesting that he knows something, which Walter reports as a kind of miracle, but I don't think it's a miracle. He's hearing everything that's going on and is quite able to talk to the monks about it. Um, toward the end, uh, he asks for various, he asks for his, his, uh, conf his copy of Augustine's Confessions to be brought to him, the glossed uh, Gospel of John, some relics, uh, and, the, and the monks are still gathering around him. And Walter says, regarding the number of people who are there, so vehemently was this lover of us all loved by us. Blessed is that abbot who deserves so to be loved by his own. And he indeed, whose memory is blessed forevermore, himself counted this the greatest of all blessings, that he should be chosen by God and men to be so well beloved. It seems to be clear that at the end of Aylward's life, he, had, he was much loved by his monks, and that there was a memory of that that continued in the Abbey, so that the copy of his pastoral prayer, um, there's only one manuscript of it. It's kept in uh, the Library of Jesus College, Cambridge, and in it, we have the prayer. It's the it's the manuscript that contains um, the catalog of the, of the Library of Riveau, for example. It contains important documents from Riveau and the pastoral prayer. And above it, uh, two hands have written in 14th century, uh, 14th century hands, have quoted him saying, for example, uh, I swear that I have never in my life let the day end when I have marked it by even speaking sharply to any of my brothers. He was above all a man of love, a man of peace, and his entire career showed this reaction against the violence done to his ancestors. His own coming through that and learning authority, peace, and love. And I think those things show in everything he wrote. I haven't talked about what he wrote because that's a whole different subject, but during this whole time he was writing. So when we go back to him who says, I go out into the field and I meditate on scripture, and then suddenly Rebecca comes to meet me. Your grace, Jesus, scatters the darkness with your light. We hear the voice of Aelred, who has, who has placed his life into the hands of God and is prepared at all times to hear the voice of Rebecca in God. Oh,